Hello and welcome to day two of Torah portions. Looks like I'll be recording uh, one a day with these. Um, good news, as you'll know from a couple of weeks ago uh, when the video went up, the internet is working sufficiently here to send video files uh, to the UK so that I can edit them on the uh, a computer in the UK and send them to the fellowship computer so that they can be streamed out live and all of that's working good and we can control the computers in the UK from here to do everything that we need to so there should be your willing no trouble with any of these um, so the Torah portion is via Lech um, and this Torah portion is a very, very small one. It's only one chapter of scripture. So I imagine that the length of the video is going to be uh, shorter than the usual Torah portion. But we will cover some interesting things. We'll cover, um, in the first part, the fear of Yahweh, what exactly that is, how it was lacking, we'll see, in the lives of the Israelites um, and how they could have benefited from a bit of the fear of Yahweh. They were told exactly what was going to happen to them after Moshe departed um, and yet it just seems to pass them by as the word does so many people uh, today who have stark warning about where they are actually are at. Um, We'll continue that theme in the second part. And in the third part, I want to talk about something that I've covered uh, that I don't want people to misunderstand. And that's the idea of uh, praying to Yehovah and asking him what you should do. Um, so I want to cover that in a, a little bit more detail about what we should do, what is good to do, and about what is... Um, bordering on testing Yehovah. So we'll cover that in the third part. So Torah portion starts, first verse of chapter 31. It's just the whole chapter, chapter 31. Moshe went and spoke these words to all Israel. And I've mentioned this before. It may well have been through the mouth of the officers that this is done. We'll often hear of that in scripture, Yehovah doing something by the hand of somebody else, or even people uh, doing something by the hand of somebody else. Jeremiah writing by the hand of Baruch, for example. So Moshe went and spoke these words to all Yisrael, and he said to them, I am 120 years old today. I am no longer able to go out and come in and Yehovah has said to me, you do not pass over this Yardim. And when we read this in English, we can think, well, he was getting on a bit in, in age. He's no longer able to go out and come in. But the Hebrew phrase, I believe, means something more akin to leading. Um, because Joshua is obviously going to take over as the leader. Um, we know that it wasn't to do with how Moshe was uh, in his health because in Deuteronomy 34 verse 7 it says Moshe was 120 years old when he died his eyes were not dim nor his freshness gone so that phrase uh, I'm no longer able to go out or come in uh, cannot mean anything to do with his vitality Verse 3 says, Yehovah your Elohim is passing over before you. He shall destroy these nations from before you and you possess them. Yehoshua himself is passing over before you as Yehovah has spoken. So he's telling them what is going to happen. He is not going to lead anymore. Joshua is going to lead them into the land. And Yehovah has done to them as he has done to Sichon and to Og, the kings of the Amorites and their land, which he, uh, when he destroyed them. And Yehovah has given them over to you 
and you have done to them according to all the command which I have commanded you. Be strong and courageous, do not fear, nor be afraid of them, for it is Yehovah your Elohim who is going with you. He does not fail you, nor forsake you. And we've looked at how this uh, can be seen in our lives to be those things that we must overcome, those tests which we find difficult to do. Whatever it is that we're finding difficult to do, we're not to be in fear or afraid of it. We are to remember that Yehovah is with us and he will give us a victory. And we have faith that he will not fail us or forsake us because that is what he has told us. Verse 7 says, And Moshe called Yahushua and said to him before the eyes of all Israel, Be strong and courageous, for you do go in with this, with this people to the land, which Yehovah has sworn to their fathers to give them, and you do cause them to inherit it. And it is Yehovah who is going before you. He himself is with you. He does not fail you, nor forsake you. Do not fear, nor be discouraged and we we saw when we were doing um the book of joshua at the end of the last torah portion cycle we did another four torah portions covering the book of joshua for anyone that is interested um but joshua is told he's encouraged uh, numerous times do not fear nor be discouraged be strong and courageous and that same advice is good for us when we encounter these uh, these tests and Moshe wrote this Torah and gave it to the priests now again it says Moshe wrote the Torah it could be like it was with Jeremiah and Baruch that it was by the hand of Joshua that Moshe wrote the uh, Torah and again we covered that in uh, the first of the Torah portions covering the book of Joshua. The sons of Levi, who bore the Ark of the Covenant of Yehovah and to all the elders of Israel. And Moshe commanded them, saying, At the end of seven years, at the appointed time, the year of release, at the fe festival of tents, or the festival of Sukkot, um, as we would call it, we just call it Sukkot. When all Yisrael comes to appear before Yehovah your Elohim in the place which he chooses, read this Torah before all Yisrael in their hearing. So Moshe, right up until the end, what he is concerned with is after his passing, they will have the Torah. Moshe is somebody who uh, recognizes the importance of this. And he says to them to, that they are to read it at Sukkot and it will be every seven years as we'll see assemble the people the men and the women and the little ones and your sojourner who is within your gates so that they hear so that they learn to fear Yehovah your Elohim cherish to do all the words of this Torah and their children who have not known it should hear and learn to fear Yehovah your Elohim as long as you live in the land you are passing over the ordain to possess. And we read about this sort of thing multiple times in scripture where they are told um, that the teachings of Torah will teach them how to fear Yehovah. And when we think of what it is to fear Yehovah, if we think of the English concept of fear, it's limited to being afraid. But the Hebrew concept of fear is much more expansive than just being afraid of Yehovah and if that subject interests you there is a video on the channel called the fear of Yehovah wherein uh, there are two teachings one from me and one from Charlie on what the fear of Yehovah is and we examine scriptures so I would point you to this um, I'm going to briefly cover some verses, but this uh, this will give you a more uh, complete overview. Psalm 33, 18 
It says, see, the eye of Yehovah is on those fearing him, on those waiting for his kindness. So we see why it is good to fear Yehovah, why that is something that we should seek to understand, because what is promised to those who fear Yehovah uh, is great. Uh, Nehemiah 1 verse 11 says, O Yehovah, I pray, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servants and to the prayer of your servants who delight to fear your name. Okay, and that's the Hebrew verb, yare, to yare your name. Okay, so uh, Nehemiah or Nehemiah asks Yehovah that his ear would be attentive to the prayer of those who fear him. Psalm 61 verse 5, For you, O Elohim, have heard my vows. You have given me the inheritance of those who yare your name. Okay, so there is an inheritance, that which is promised to those who fear his name. Matthew 13, 10 to 11 says, And the disciples came to Yeshua and said to him, Why do you speak to them in parables? And he answering said to them, because it has been given to you to know the secrets of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. So it is a good thing to know the secrets of the kingdom of heaven. And scripture gives us more information about uh, to whom that understanding is given. In Proverbs 16, 22, it says, Understanding is a fountain of life to him who has it, but the disciplining of fools is folly. So what Yeshua is talking about there is a fountain of life to those who have it. Okay, it has been given to you to know the secrets of the kingdom of heaven, but to those it has not been given. The secret of Yehovah is with those who fear him and he makes his covenant known to them so again it is given to you to know the secrets of the kingdom of heaven but to them it is not being given so this is um how one begins to understand the fear of yehovah is the beginning of understanding the beginning of wisdom um the secret of yehovah is with those who fear him so it is given to those who fear Yehovah to understand the secrets of the kingdom of heaven second Kings 17 27 to 28 says the king of Ashur commanded saying send one of, the, one of the priests whom you exiled from there to go there let him go and dwell there and let him teach the, teach them the justice of the Elohim of the land and one of the priests whom they had exiled from Shomeron came and dwelt in Bethel and taught them how to fear Yehovah because um, they knew that the God of the land was against them, who was Yehovah. So a priest was sent to teach them the Torah, teach them how to uh, fear Yehovah. Deuteronomy 17, 18 to 19 says, it shall be when he sits on the throne of his kingdom that is the king uh, that the Israelites will choose for them, that he shall write for himself a copy of this Torah in a book from one before the priests, the Levites. And it shall be with him and he shall read it all the days of his life so that he learns to Yare Yehovah his Elohim and cherish all the words of this Torah. So that is inherent with the concept of fearing Yehovah. Not just being afraid, but it is also to uh, kind of to be in awe of, to worship Yehovah. And worship of Yehovah is seen in obedience to his word. If you adore something, if you worship it, then you would try to emulate it because you hold it with such reverence and awe that you want to be like that. So to worship Yehovah is to cherish his word and to obey his commands. It's not what 
we might think of as a worship service where you get a guy uh, going up on stage and singing Christian worship songs. That's not worship, that's singing praise to Yehovah. But worship is something different. Worship involves the fear of Yehovah, which then leads to understanding, leads to wisdom, and it leads to obedience and cherishing of his word. Psalm 34, 11 to 14 says, Come you children, listen to me. Let me teach you the fear of Yehovah. And again, if we're understanding things in uh, terms of the English word fear, then the idea of being taught how to fear doesn't really mesh, it doesn't really work. But when we understand that the concept is much more expansive in Hebrew, then it makes sense. Let me teach you the fear of Yehovah. Okay, let me teach you what it is to walk in his ways, to be in reverence and awe of him and to cherish his word. Let me teach you those things that you do to fear him. What is the man who desires life, who loves many days in order to see good? Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. Turn away from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. So this worship, this fear of Yehovah involves his name as well. We looked last time at how his name, his spirit, his word are all synonymous with one, one another because they are all of him. They are all him, if you like. The fear of Yehovah is the same. It's something which comes from Yehovah and its nature is Yehovah himself. So we should expect that the fear of Yehovah involves this incorporation of his name, his spirit, his word dwelling in one's heart. Deuteronomy 6, 1-2 says, This is the command, the laws, and the judgments which Yehovah your Elohim has commanded to teach you to do in the land which you are passing over to possess, so that you fear Yehovah your Elohim. Okay, so to teach you to do these things, the command, the laws, the judgments which Yehovah has commanded, those things which came from him so that you fear you do those things and that is a part of what it is to fear Yehovah to cherish all his laws and his commands which I command you you and your son and your grandson all the days of your life and that your days be prolonged Deuteronomy 6 20 to 25 tells us when your son asks you in time to come, saying, What is the meaning of the witnesses and the laws and the judgments which Yehovah our Elohim has commanded you? Then you shall say to your son, We were slaves of Pharaoh in Mitraim, and Yehovah brought us out of Mitraim with a strong hand. This remembrance of what Yehovah has done um, is important. And we looked last time at the reason why doing Sukkot is important. The, the actual reason Yehovah gives us so that you remember when the children of Israel dwelt in Sukkot, when Yehovah brought them out of Mitraim. Yehovah sent signs and wonders, great and grievous upon Mitraim, upon Pharaoh and upon all his household before our eyes. And he brought us out from there to bring us in, to give us the land of which he swore to our fathers. And Yehovah commanded us to do these laws, to fear Yehovah our Elohim for our good always, to keep us alive as it is today. And the laws, when things in the word are difficult, we personally find them difficult, to do, not that they're objectively difficult, just that we personally find them difficult to do because we want to do uh, something else. It is the fear of Yehovah which will uh, cause you to do those things. Fear of Yehovah, the love of Yehovah, both of them are kind of 
intertwined the worship of Yahovah, reverence and awe for Yahovah. It's all the same concept, not in English, but in Hebrew, Yareh is all of those things. And it is righteousness for us when we cherish to do all this command before Yehovah our Elohim as he commanded us. 1 Samuel 12, 14 to 15 says, If you Yareh Yehovah and shall serve him and obey his voice and not rebel against the command of Yehovah, then both you and the king who reigns over you shall follow Yehovah your Elohim. But if you do not obey the voice of Yehovah and shall rebel, so here we see fearing, serving, obeying. This is all the fear of Yahuwah. Not fearing Yahuwah is disobedience and rebellion. And often you'll get people who, they kind of, they think that they fear Yahuwah because they fear him as in um, they're scared of what he might do because of their disobedience. And so they think that they're obeying him because of fear of him, when actually they're obeying him because of fear of the consequences to themselves. If we were to phrase that in Hebrew with the word Yare, we would say that they do not Yare Yehovah, they Yare themselves. They cherish themselves, they um, reverence themselves and what they want for themselves so if somebody is doing something because they don't want to be punished by Yehovah it's not necessarily the Yare of Elohim that they have it's often um, and I've seen this many times but it's it's often them wanting their life to be good for them so they don't want to upset Yahuwah because they want to avoid him punishing them. Job 28 verse 28, this is uh, Job speaking. He said to him, see the Yare of Yahuwah, that is wisdom and to turn from evil is understanding. Okay, so the Yare of Yahuwah is the beginning of wisdom, is the beginning of of understanding and Job actually recognizes this which is interesting because Job was living in a time before the scriptures existed so his understanding of Yehovah came from another place perhaps from his fear of him his um, his reverence of Yehovah his um, cherishing of Yehovah, his love of Yehovah, perhaps his understanding of the secrets of Yehovah came from the fact that that's who he was as a person and so those things came to him in whatever form they did. Yehovah is able to do that of course but it's interesting that Job is talking about the fear of Yehovah well before the scriptures were, were ever written. In Isaiah 11, 1 to 3, it says, A rod shall come forth from the stump of Yeshai, and a sprout from his root shall bear fruit. The spirit of Yehovah shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge, and of the fear of Yehovah. Now that's actually talking about Yeshua. And when we think of him having the fear of Yehovah, if we're understanding that by the English word fear, it seems a little bit strange that he would be scared of that which he is the word of made flesh. Wouldn't seem to make sense, but now that we understand this concept is a little bit deeper than that, verses like this start to make sense. And shall make him breathe in the fear of Yehovah. He shall not judge by the sight of his eyes, nor decide by the hearing of of his ears rather by the word of Yehovah and this is how those who fear Yehovah are when they see a situation they don't think well what can I do to benefit me in this situation 
The example that I always go with is working on Shabbat. Do I need to work on Shabbat to bring money in for myself? Well, maybe the sight of my eyes or the hearing of my ears would convince me that that's what I need to do. However, what we are to do is to walk in the fear of Yehovah. So the answer to the question, should I work on Shabbat to one who fears Yehovah is obviously no. One who fears Yehovah would not ever work on Shabbat. They wouldn't walk by the sight of their eyes or the hearing of their ears. Genesis 32 verse 11 says, Deliver me, I pray, from the hand of my brother, from the hand of Asaph, for I fear him, I yareh him. So Jacob here is talking using the word yareh. So we can see that sometimes it does mean to actually be afraid of Yehovah because of an understanding of who he is. So I'm not telling you not to be fearful of Yehovah. We see when Isaiah is stuck before him in the temple, he is shaking, he's trembling. In Deuteronomy 20 verse 8, it says, And the officers shall speak further to the people and say, Who is the man who is afraid and tender of heart? Let him go and return to his house. So here again, it's used of actual being fearful of something. So I'm not trying to say that fear is not a component of the fear of Yehovah. Fear is, we understand it in English. I'm just trying to say it, it's a lot more expansive. And we see this, um, this principle in Judges 7, 2 to 3. It says, And Yehovah said to Gedon, The people who are with you are too many for me to give Midian into their hands, lest Yisrael boast against me, saying, My own hand has saved me. It seems that Yehovah uh, delights in some way in um, giving people victory against the odds. And if you think of, again, of those obstacles in, in your life, where you think, there's no way that this can work out if I obey Yehovah. Know that Yehovah delights in giving you the victory in such circumstances, so that you can't say, it is my own hand that has done this. If you go about your life trying to uh, do what you think is going to be beneficial, then you can say, it's my own hand who's done this. But Yehovah wants you to recognize him in your life. He wants you to trust him in those situations in which you are fearful that he will be with you. And now proclaim in the hearing of the people saying, whoever is afraid and trembling, let him turn back and leave Mount Gilad. So Yehovah uses the word Yahweh here to mean an actual fear that is um, being scared of. In Numbers 15, 30 to 31, it says, the soul who does whatever defiantly, whether he is a native or a stranger, he reviles Yehovah, and that soul shall be cut off from among his people. Okay, so doing something defiantly against Yehovah, you revile him, and that word can mean to blaspheme Yehovah, also Gaddaf. Because he has despised, and that word is Bazaar, the word of Yehovah, and it doesn't mean he's hated the word of Yehovah um, as we would use the word despise. It means to lightly esteem or to think little of the word of Yehovah. If you do something knowing that the word says not to do it, or you don't do something knowing that the word says to do it, then you are doing that thing defiantly and you are counting the word of Yehovah as of little esteem, of little weight, of little importance. You're thinking little of the word of Yehovah. You can justify it to yourself however you want and you can say, oh no, I, I reference the word of Yehovah. But if you treat it in such a way that you defiantly go against it okay in the hebrew to sin with the high hand then you are showing that you you place your own understanding above yahovah as you you lean on your own understanding so to speak and has broken his command 
that soul shall certainly be cut off his iniquity is upon him and it is because of this thinking little of the word of Yahuwah the people don't fear him to fear him is the opposite of what it is to bazaar his word it is to give great esteem and reverence and respect to Yahuwah in Malachi 1 verse 6 it says a son esteems his father and a servant his master and if I'm the father where is my esteem okay that's the word uh, kavod it is where is my weight where is my glory next he asks if I'm a master where is my fear where is my esteem where is my fear they are um, somewhat synonymous with one another you lightly esteem his word you don't fear him if you esteem him then you do fear him said Yehovah Sabaoth to you priests who despise my name so again that's to give little esteem where is my fear you who despise my name you who despise my spirit despise my word but you asked in what way have we despised your name and people will commonly not understand that they are just writing off the word of Yehovah. Obviously, the priests may well have thought, well, of course we reverence Yehovah. Of course we esteem his word. We are the ones to whom it has been given. We teach it to people. However, Yehovah recognizes, you do not fear me. You do not esteem me. You bazaar my name you bazaar my word and you show that by your actions you can call yourself whatever you want you can call yourself a christian you can call yourself a torah keeper a nazarene a follower of the way whatever it is if that is just something that you have labeled yourself while you bazaar his word though that is not what you actually are and it is not the name that yahovah would describe to you malachi 2 verse 5 says my covenant with him was life and peace and i gave them to him to fear and he feared my name and stood in awe of my name my name my spirit my word whatever you want to put in there he feared me and stood in awe of me that's what it is to fear him that's what it is to reverence him to uh, highly esteem him Genesis 22 11 to 12 says but the angel of Yehovah called to him from the heavens and said Abraham Abraham and he said here I am and he said do not lay your hand on the boy nor touch him for now I know that you Yahweh Elohim seeing you have not withheld your son your only son from me and maybe you're not going to be asked to sacrifice your son as a burnt offering but maybe you are going to be asked something that is precious to you and in fact this is the course of events you're not tested in the things you find easy if you find it easy to do all of the Torah all well and good that is a good thing however it's in the things that you find difficult to do that you will be tested and when you do them Elohim would say to you now I know that you fear me you Yahweh me you highly esteem me you do not lightly esteem my word even when it's something that is a big deal to you you uh, highly esteem me Exodus 9 20 to 21 says those among the servants of Pharaoh who feared the word of Yehovah made their servants and livestock flee to the houses so they heard the word that came from Yehovah that there was going to be a plague of hail and those who feared the word who gave weight to the word took their valuable stuff out of harm's way but those who did not set their heart on the word which gives us the opposite of what it is to fear Yehovah to not set your heart on the word is the opposite of fearing him they left their servants and livestock in the field 
And you can say the same for any act of obedience or disobedience. If you read something in the Word, those who fear Yehovah will do it, but those who do not set their hearts on the Word will not do it. Psalm 128 verse 1 says, Blessed are all who fear Yehovah, who walk in his ways. That's what it is to fear Yehovah, according to Psalm 128. Proverbs 8 verse 13 says, The fear of Yehovah is to hate evil. I have hated pride and arrogance, the evil way and the perverse mouth. And you will notice this pride and this arrogance amongst those people who do not fear Yehovah. The opposite of fearing Yehovah and hating evil is having pride and arrogance. Especially if one knows the word of Elohim and decides to act defiantly, to sin with a high hand, um, to lightly esteem his word. That all comes from pride and it comes from arrogance. And something that I've noticed with people who are disobedient and are prideful and arrogant with his word, who lightly esteem it, is that they, when they're studying the Torah, it's all about them. Their understanding of the Torah is about them. If they're in a Torah group, other people's understanding of Torah is actually all about them. They are the thing which they fear. Yehovah is not, um, is not the center of their focus. It's not what it's all about. It's not about how can we please Yehovah. It's about how can I learn more about Torah and feel like I am more informed. And the, the motives just aren't the fear of Yehovah. So watch out for that in people. If what drives them in the Torah study and the uh, Torah obedience is not fear of Yehovah and a reverence for Yehovah and a love of Yehovah, but is in fact more about them, then you will see those people probably being disobedient. Maybe they mask it really well. But if somebody's motives are not drawn from the fear of Yehovah, but rather from the fear of themselves, then um, they are the sort of people who will not obey his word because they don't understand why they would obey his word when it's hard. When the hard tests come, they don't pass those tests. They might do all the acts of obedience. They might do all the works of Torah, before you, they might do all those feasts, they might be wearing ZT, whatever it is that you can see with your eyes. But when it comes to that hard thing that they're tested in, then they uh, are not driven by that motive, the fear of Yehovah. What you will see come to the surface is what drives them is a fear of themselves, or rather a Yahweh of themselves. We'll come back in the second part and we'll continue to look at that as pertains to uh, the Israelites when they were given the Torah uh, just before they entered into the land, the second generation. In verse 14 it says, And Yehovah spoke, I uh, said to Moses, See the days have drawn near for you to die. Call Yehoshua, and present yourselves in the tent of meeting so that I command him. And Moshe and Yehoshua went and presented themselves in the tent of meeting. So this is where Moses has been meeting with uh, Yehovah. Um, and Yehovah has been appearing to him. And this is where their conversations have taken place. Joshua we find out elsewhere in the Torah, has also been in the tent of meeting. And when um, Moshe goes back to his own tent or leaves, Joshua would stay in the tent of meeting. But here they both go there together. And Yehovah appeared in the tent in a cloud, column of cloud, and the column of cloud stood above the door of the tent. 
And Yehovah said to Moshe, See, you are about to sleep with your fathers, and this people is risen and whored after the gods of the strangers of the land into the midst of which they have entered, and forsaken me and broken my covenant, which I have made with them. And we think, well, we're not going to be worshipping foreign gods. I don't even know any foreign gods, maybe Zeus and Thor or something like that. But that's not what it's talking about, of course, as we've seen before. Um, what the Israelites did, the house of Israel in particular, were charged with setting up idols in their own hearts. And it says that they set their um, iniquity before their face, which means that was what they were worshipping. That was the false act idol idol whatever it was that caused them to stumble that's what they feared we remember the word yare in hebrew doesn't just mean the english word fear so really i shouldn't use the word fear instead of yare because yare is such a much broader concept but the false idols are what people yare when I'm talking about people yareing themselves, I shouldn't say they fear themselves because um, I'm not trying to get across the English concept fear. I'm trying to say they yare themselves. If you think of Yeshua in the Garden of Gethsemane, when he said, if you be willing, take this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will be done, but yours. That is the Yahre of Yehovah. If he had Yahreed himself, then maybe he wouldn't have gone to the cross. But because he had the fear of Yehovah, or the Yahre, uh, more precisely, of Yehovah, that's exactly what he did. He wanted Yehovah's will to be done, even though it was going to turn out to be bad for himself. Just like Abraham. If Abraham yareed himself, then maybe he wouldn't have wanted to offer Isaac as a burnt offering. He liked Isaac. Isaac was his son. He didn't want Isaac to die. So if he yareed himself, he wouldn't have done it. That's why I say people who yareed themselves are the people who will fail the hard things. They might do all of the easy things, they might find those easy to do and they might revel in learning the Torah, learning all about Yehovah, but it's actually about them. It's about the Yare of themselves. And when something comes along which threatens them, then they will stumble because it was never about doing it because they Yareed Yehovah. It was about doing it because they Yareed themselves maybe they wanted to feel like they were closer to Elohim like the people who go to all of these conferences and they hear people this prophet or that prophet or this person who can do healings you find this a lot in the uh, Christian world because they want to feel close to Elohim but not because they yare Elohim it's because they yare themselves and they want that experience they want to feel like they're like that with the Creator, because they acknowledge that the Creator exists. But acknowledging that He exists and believing in Him doesn't then lead to a Yare of Him. It just leads, because they have a Yare of themselves, it just leads them to want to know more about Him and feel closer to Him. So just believing that He exists is not the belief which is spoken of as being accounted as righteousness because that belief is the Yare of Yehovah. So Abraham, he showed that he was willing to sacrifice his son and Yehovah, the angel said to him, no, I, I know now that you Yare Yehovah because of your actions and often these tests will turn out in that way. Yehovah will ask something of you and he just wants to see whether or not you're prepared to give that thing. Maybe he will never require it of you to give that thing. Again, going back to working on Shabbat, maybe you think that you're going to lose your job. 
And maybe Yahweh wants you to act in a way that you think will cause you to lose your job so that he can see that you yare him. And then he'll work out things so that you, in fact, don't lose your job and gives you favor in the eyes of men or whatever the situation might transpire to be. But here, these people, um, Yahweh is telling them, when you die, they're going to rise up and they're going to worship all of these false gods. And with us, that can be whatever idol we set in our heart. It could be money. When Yehovah tells us, do this with your money, we see a poor person on the side of the street and we turn our face from them and we don't help them because we want that money for ourselves. That's the array of ourself. Whereas if we are Elohim, of course we do his word. We cherish to do his word. Verse 17 says, Then my displeasure shall burn against them in that day, and I shall forsake them and hide my face from them, and they shall be consumed, and many evils and distresses shall come upon them. And it shall be said in that day, Is it not because our Elohim is not in our midst that these evils have come upon us? So Yahweh says that he's going to be angry with them and his displeasure is going to be manifest towards them. He'll forsake them and hide his face from them. They'll be consumed and in that day they'll recognize that it's, not, it's because he's not among them. And I have certainly hidden my face in that day because of all the evil which they have done for they shall set, turn toward the gods. So it's not enough that they recognize that he's not in their midst. Okay, that is something along the road to his people turning in repentance. But we see in scripture, sometimes it's just too late for people to repent because they've turned their ear away so many times that Yehovah says, no, enough, that's it. I will not turn my wrath from you. And if you go back and watch Torah portion Bo from this year, uh, you'll see, and uh, Char Charlie did the Torah portion more recently, uh, wherein he was talking about these things. Um, I believe it was Devarim and Ve'et Hanan. If you go back and watch that Torah portion, he talks about the same thing. To seek Yehovah while he can be found. Not afterwards. Not when you've just turned your ear from what you're saying and then you realize, oh wait, the Elohim's not in our midst. Everything's going bad. Maybe now we should decide to repent. That is not pleasing to Yehovah. If he gives you chance after chance after chance and you just have turned your ear all of those times there will come a point when that's it and you you've blown it with Yehovah if you are stubborn in that way and you turn your ear from what he's saying so many times he doesn't want that to happen uh, for people and of course he wants people to repent and that's why he gives them all of that all, all of that many chances to repent. It's only when somebody is given all those chances to repent and they decide, nope, I'm not going to do it. Then Yehovah may well hide his face from that person in that day. So even when these people recognize Elohim's not in our midst, he says, I've certainly hidden my face in that day because of all the evil which they've done, for they shall turn to other gods. So if you've got those idols in your heart, something which is preventing you from doing Yehovah's word or which you fear over Yehovah, then be aware that if you consistently go after that and pay no heed to the warnings that Elohim uh, may well have enough with you one day. He may well harden your heart at that point. That seems to be what he does. He strengthens people's hearts in their rebellion. They might think, oh, I'm going to turn my ear, I'm going to turn my ear, I'm going to turn my ear, because now I can understand that I need to repent. 
But Yehovah hardens people's hearts so that they're strengthened in their rebellion because he's not mocked whatever a person sows that they shall reap and he knows how to preserve the wicked unto the day of uh, judgment. So we might think of ourselves wiser than Elohim that we can just um, decide when to repent in some future moment. But Elohim, if he decides that he's had enough with the person, he will harden them in their rebellion. He will harden their heart against them. Verse 19 says, And now write down this song for yourselves and teach it to the children of Israel. Put it in their mouths so, this, so that this song is to me for a witness against the children of Israel. So what Charlie will be covering in his Torah portion next week in uh, Torah portion Hazinu um, is this piece of scripture which is a distinct warning to those people or to Israel, his people, about how they stumble, about them falling into iniquity. He says here, this song will be a witness against the children of Israel. And all of scripture, all of the Torah, is either a witness for us or it's a witness against us. It's one or the other. The word can bring life or the word can kill. It depends how we uh, respond to the word. Verse 20 says, And I have brought them into the land flown with milk and honey, of which I swore to their fathers, and they have eaten and been satisfied and been fat. Then they have turned to other gods, and they have served them, and scorned me, broken my covenant. And it has been when many evils and distresses do meet him. Okay, talking of Israel, talking of Jacob, the people are talked of as a him here that this song has answered before them as a witness for it is not to be forgotten in the mouths of his seed for i have known their imaginings which he is forming today even before i bring them to the land of which i swore to give them so we see this sw uh, switching between he and them referring to jacob the man the progenitor from whom all of these children came, the nation came, and them talking of his children, but all of it is referring to the people, Israel, not just them, but us as well. If we take upon us the identity of Israel and we are born again as Israel, or reborn rather, according to the word, as Israel, it's also talking about us, and we'll see. Uh, in the song next week that there are dire warnings about certain sorts of behavior and they're written there for anybody who fears Yehovah anybody who gets that understanding gets that wisdom the secrets of the kingdom of heaven it's given to them to understand because they fear Yehovah and Moshe write this song the same day and does teach it to the children of Israel. Okay, so it's not just this song, as I've said, that all of Scripture is either a witness for us or it's a witness against us. We behold our natural face as if in a mirror when we read Scripture. Some of it is going to be your natural face is in accordance with the word but some of it's going to be a witness against us and when we behold our natural face we're going to realize that his word is a witness against how we are and we must take heed not to walk away and forget exactly what it is that we look like if we find something which is a witness against us verse 23 says and he commanded Yehoshua son of Nun and said be strong and courageous for you are to bring the children of Israel into the land of which I swore to them, and I myself am with you. Again, it's this encouragement to Yehoshua, which should be encouragement to us also. Yehovah is not just with uh, Joshua. He's also 
with us. He will also do what he has promised in our lives and he is with us, whatever enemies um, are against us. And it came to be when Moshe had completed writing the words of this Torah in the book until their completion, that Moshe commanded the Levites who bore the Ark of the Covenant of Yehovah saying, take this book of the Torah, place it beside the Ark of the Covenant of Yehovah your Elohim, and it shall be there as a witness against you. Okay, and we can see uh, the Torah placed behind, beside the Ark of the Covenant as being like the Torah and our hearts. Okay, it's, uh, it says that it shall be as a witness against you. It can also be as a witness for you. But he's talking here to uh, these people who, uh, who is, he has been warned will turn against Yehovah. For I myself know your rebellion and your stiff neck. See, while, while I am still alive with you today, you have been rebellious against Yehovah. Then how much more after my death? Okay, so place the Torah next to the Ark of the Covenant. It's going to be a witness against you. As I've said, the law can either be a witness for us or a witness against us. If the law is written on our hearts, fleshly hearts, then it is a witness for us that we are those who yare Yehovah. But if it's written on a heart of stone, then it will bring death and it is a witness against us. It's a, a ministration of death, as Paul says. In 2 Corinthians 3, 2 to 8, it says, you are our, our letter, having been written in our hearts, known and read by all men making it obvious that you are a letter of messiah served by us written not with ink but by the spirit of the living elohim not on tablets of stone but on fleshly tablets of the heart and such trust we have toward elohim through the messiah not that we are competent in ourselves to reckon any matter as from ourselves but our competence is from Elohim, if we yare Elohim, if we worship him and we walk in his ways, then we are competent. Who also made us competent as servants of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the spirit. For the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. But if the administering of death in letters engraved on stones was esteemed so that the children of Israel were unable to look steadily at the face of Moshe because of the esteem of his face which was passing away. In other words, those Israelites had the letters of the Torah written on hearts of stone and that was glorious. How much more esteemed shall the administering of the Spirit not be? Okay, so if... You allow the spirit to write on your heart. How much more glorious is that? The, the law by itself is glorious when you are being disobedient to it. And that will bring death to you because you have a heart of stone. How much more glorious is the law when it's in full effect in somebody's life, when it has been written by the spirit on their heart? Galatians 3, 21 to 22 says, Is the Torah then against the promises of Elohim? Let it not be. For if a law had been given that was able to make alive, truly righteousness would have been by Torah. But we know from Abraham that his faith was accounted to him as righteousness. Yehovah wants to give people grace if they have faith in him but in fact all people have uh, sinned and fallen short of the esteem of uh, Yehovah and all the Torah can do on its own is declare you to be a sinner it's a witness against you but the scripture has shut up all mankind under sin that the promise by belief in Yeshua Messiah might be given to those who believe okay so all of sin the fallen short of the glory of Elohim the scripture has stood against all people 
and declared all of them to have fallen short of Elohim's glory so that Elohim can give the promise by belief in Yeshua Messiah. It's of Elohim that salvation comes, not of us. In our state where the law is a witness against us that we have failed and that we are in a state where we will perish, there's nothing that we can do in that state to save ourselves or to save anyone else. It requires belief in Elohim. Romans 7, 7 to 14 says, What then shall we say? Is the Torah sin? Let it not be. However, I did not know sin except through the Torah. So Paul explains why he's saying here. The Torah defines sin. For also the covetousness, I knew not if Torah had not said, you shall not covet. But sin, having taken through occasion through the command, did work in me all sorts of covetousness. For apart from Torah, sin is dead. So sin was within each one of us. And sin is deceitful. The deceivableness or the deceitfulness of sin. And the Torah pronounces that we are guilty. It is a witness against us. So the sin that works in us deceives us so that we put ourselves in a position where uh, the word of Elohim witnesses against us and we are under the death penalty, so to, set, so to speak. And I was alive apart from the Torah once, but when the command came, the sin revived and I died. Okay, so if there was no Torah, then any actions that we did would not entail death upon us. The thing which entails death upon us is the Torah. The Torah tells us, if you do this, you will die. We wouldn't die without the Torah because that's what, um, that is what defines um, whereby we will die. Without that, we wouldn't die. It doesn't mean that uh, the Torah itself is a bad thing. It just means that Elohim's proclamation of what sin is, is within the Torah. The command which was to result in life, this I found to result in death. So when Elohim gives the Torah, he doesn't give it to uh, kill people. He gives it to bring life. That's what the command is actually for. But sin which works within us deceives us and by the power which is in the Torah pronounces death upon us because we sin and then we're under death. For sin, having taken the occasion through the command, deceived me and through it killed me. Not that the command's a bad thing, the command was supposed to result in life, but because sin deceives us and we sin, because that command has power and entails death upon us, that means that we're under the death penalty. So that the Torah is set apart and the command set apart and righteous and good. Therefore, has that which is good become death to me? Let it not be. But the sin, the sin might be manifest, was working death in me through what is good so that sin through the command might be rendered as sinfulness or exceedingly sinful, however you would uh, translate that word. So sin uses the sin which is within us that we are to master, as we're told in Genesis 4. That takes what is meant for good, what is to instruct us as to life, and it works in us death by that which was meant for good. For we know that the Torah is spiritual, but I am fleshly sold under sin. So when we walk according to the flesh and not according to the spirit, we entail death upon ourselves. 
we are to walk according to the spirit and the command which is meant for good uh, entails good and life upon us life everlasting Deuteronomy 30 verse 14 says for the word is very near you in your mouth and in your heart to do it okay so the word is in one's heart if one fears Elohim and we saw that before in Exodus 9 those among the servants of of Pharaoh rather who yared the word of Yahuwah made their servants and livestock flee to their houses but those who did not set their heart on the word of Yehovah left their servants and livestock in the field. So we see from that to fear the word of Yehovah is to set one's heart upon it. Proverbs 17 verse 16 says, Why is this a price in the hand of a fool to buy wisdom without heart? If you um, come to a great knowledge of the Torah, a great knowledge of wisdom, a great knowledge of that which is meant for what is good, but you don't have heart, you don't have the fear of Yahuwah, then what that will bring upon you is death. And that which was meant for good will be used by the sin in you to entail death upon you. Wisdom is found on the lips of him who has understanding, but a rod is for the back of him who lacks heart okay so that which is meant for good is found on the lips of him who has understanding he who understands the secrets of the kingdom he who fears Yehovah but a rod is for the back of him who lacks heart him who doesn't fear Yehovah um, and again that which was meant for good entails evil upon the back of him who does not uh, fear Yehovah. Deuteronomy 7, 12 to 13 says, And now, Yisrael, what is Yehovah your Elohim asking of you but to fear Yehovah your Elohim, to walk in all his ways, to love him, and to serve Yehovah your Elohim with all your heart and with all your soul? To fear him, do it with all your heart. Those who feared the word of Yehovah did according to it. But those who um, did not have it in their hearts did not. To cherish the commands of Yehovah, his laws, which I command you today for your good. Micah 6 8. He has declared to you, O man, what is good, and what does Yehovah require of you, but to do right, to love kindness, and to walk humbly before your Elohim. And that's meant for good. That instruction is meant to entail good upon us. We're supposed to fear Yehovah and say, well, what does he require of me? This, that, the other. I'm going to do those things. If we do, that entails good upon us. But those who are sinful, those who are deceived by the deceivableness of sin, take that which is meant for good, disobey it, fear something else, and entail death upon themselves. Proverbs 4, uh, 4 to 12 says, Then he taught me and said to me, Let your heart again hold fast my words, guard my commands and live. Get wisdom, get understanding, do not forget and do not turn away from the words of my mouth. And we know wisdom and understanding come from the fear of Yehovah, the Yahweh rather of Yehovah. Do not leave her and let her guard you. Love her and let her watch over you. The beginning of wisdom is get wisdom and with all you're getting, get understanding. Okay, do not live, leave her, let her guard you. Let that which is meant for good entail good upon you. If you leave her, then it will entail, that which was meant for good will entail death upon you. Exalt her and let her lift you up. She brings you esteem when you embrace her. That which is meant for good will bring good when you embrace her if you don't you embrace something else you fear something else then that will entail death upon you you do not have a heart on which the law is written by the spirit you have um, a heart of stone upon which the letters of the law are written and they stand as a witness against you and entail death 
that which was meant for good entails death upon you. She gives your head a fair wreath. She shields you with an adorning crown. Hear my son and accept my words and let the years of your life be many. Let them be many. All you have to do is fear Yehovah. Stick to his word. Whatever comes up before you, the sight of your eyes, the hearing of your ears, whatever it is, fear Yehovah and say, I will not depart from this. I cannot sin against my Elohim. I have taught you in the way of wisdom. I have led you in straight paths. When you, walk, when you walk, your steps shall not be hindered. And if you run, you shall not stumble. Maybe you're running somewhere where you think, there's loads of things over which I could stumble here. But Yahovah says, if you're doing this according to my word, if you're embracing wis wisdom, when you run, you will not stumble. I will be with you. Fear not, neither be discouraged. Proverbs 4, 18 to 19 says, But the path of the righteous is like the light of dawn that shines ever brighter unto the perfect day. The way of the wrong is like darkness. They do not know at what they stumble. They have no idea. The fools, um, the way of the wrong, the wrong, the fools, those who yare themselves or yare some other uh, idol that they've set up in their heart, those who do not, uh, Yare Elohim. Those who do, the path of the righteous is like the light of dawn that shines ever brighter unto the perfect day. But those who Yare something different will never realize. They do not know at what they stumble. It has not been given to them to understand the secrets of the kingdom. Exodus 9 29 to 30. And Moshe said to him, to Pharaoh, as soon as I go out the city, let me spread out my hands to Yehovah. Let the thunder cease and the hail be no more, so that you know that the earth belongs to Yehovah. But as for you and your servants, I know that you do not yare before Yehovah Elohim. Okay, when Pharaoh sees these things happen, maybe he gets an understanding that he needs to do what Yehovah says. But each time Yehovah hardens his heart because Pharaoh has decided to disobey Yehovah. And Yehovah isn't going to let him at the last minute start to obey him in order to um, avoid negative consequences for himself. He strengthens his heart. Don't let that be you. Exodus 9 verse 34 says, And Pharaoh saw that the rain and the hail and the thunder had ceased, yet he sinned again, and he hardened his heart, he and his servants. And this is the response that Yehovah um, sees and subsequently hardens Pharaoh's heart, strengthens him in his rebellion. If you insist on having this response to his word, even though you say that you you follow after his word and you fear him. If actually you don't, and every time you hear what it is that you're doing wrong, every time you behold your natural face as in the mirror, you forget about it and you uh, go on in disobedience, then Yehovah may well harden your heart. Deuteronomy 31, 28 says, Assemble unto me all the elders of your tribes and your officers, so that I speak these words in their hearing and call the heavens and the earth to witness against them. For I know that after my death, you do very corruptly and turn aside from the way which I commanded you and evil shall come to you in the latter days because you do what is evil in the eyes of Yehovah to provoke him through the work of your hands. Moshe knows that this is what they're going to do. And they're being told this is what you're going to do, but they don't yare Yehovah. They don't understand. They don't see what is to befall them. So Moshe spoke in the hearing of all the assembly of Israel the words of this song till their completion. And that's where Charlie will pick up uh, and he will cover the, uh, the song in Torah portion, Hazinu. Proverbs 13, verse 13 says, he who despises the word is destroyed. And that's a word which is related to 
bazaar, it's actually the word booze. Um, it is again, though, to think little of, to make light of, to lightly esteem. But he who fears the command is rewarded. So again, we see that uh, to lightly esteem is the opposite of uh, yare. In Psalm 81, 10 to 15, it says, I am Yehovah your Elohim, who brought you out of the land of Mitraim. Open your mouth wide, and I fill it. But my people did not listen to my voice, and Israel would not submit to me. So I gave them over to their own stubborn heart to walk in their own counsels. And he may well just do the same to you if you keep hardening yourself against his word you think oh maybe i'll get around to doing it one day maybe he'll see where you're at the word has revealed the thoughts and intents of your heart and yehovah will say okay enough of you i'll give you over to your stubborn heart so that you walk after that and you never turn back to me oh if my people had listened to me israel would walk in my ways i would subdue their enemies at once and turn my hand against their adversaries. Those who hate Yehovah feign obedience to him, and their time would be forever. Those who um, don't listen to the word of Yehovah, don't yare the word of Yehovah. It's not just the warnings that they don't yare, that they don't understand. It's also all of the blessings that they're told. If you would just submit to me, if you just bow the knee, then it would all go great for you. But they don't yare that either they don't believe either side of it they feign obedience to Yehovah they make a big deal of the fact that they're Torah keepers or whatever and their time would be forever when actually they're just living lives of foolishness so if you're living a futile life if you are fighting as one who beats the air as Paul says then take note of your natural face Offer the guilt offering, acknowledge it before Yehovah, and offer your sin offering of repentance. Jeremiah 6 verse 10 says, To whom shall I speak and give warning so that they hear? See, their ear is uncircumcised. They're unable to listen. See, the word of Yehovah is a reproach to them. They do not delight in it. They do not yare it. So if you've been given an opportunity to hear, and to behold your natural face, and that is a gift. Take hold of that. Proverbs 17 verse 10 says, Reproof enters deeper into a wise man than a hundred blows on a fool. Okay, you could strike a fool a hundred times and it would do less to them than if you just reprove somebody who is wise, who is able to take that reproof and say, Yep, you're right, I'll change, and then... Uh, that will bring good to me. Proverbs 12 verse 15 says, the way of a fool is right in his own eyes. You might well justify uh, sin in your life, and this may well be talking about you, but he who listens to advice is wise. And it's with that thought um, that I put together the playlist that I mentioned in Torah portion, Akev. It's on the channel. If you are somebody who can uh, recognize your natural face, can respond to reproof accordingly, then this is the Torah portion for you. And the uh, playlist rather for you. Proverbs 25 verse 12 says, A ring of gold and an ornament of fine gold is a wise one's reproof to an ear that hears. Okay, here's the, those who Yare Yehovah, they're those who understand the secret of Yehovah, the secrets of the kingdom. Psalm 25, 12 to 22 says, Who then is the man that Yare is Yehovah? He teaches him in the way that he should choose. His life dwells in good and his seed inherits the earth. That which was to bring about good does bring about good. The secret of Yehovah is with those who yare him, and he makes his covenant known to them. My eyes are ever toward Yehovah, for he brings my feet out of the net. From that snare that the deceivableness of sin has put us into. 
Turn your face to me and show me favor, for I am lonely and afflicted. The distresses of my heart have enlarged. O oh, bring me out of my distress. Look on my affliction and my toil and forgive all my sons. See how many, uh, how many my enemies have become and they hate me with a violent hatred. O oh, guard my life and deliver me. Let me not be ashamed for I have taken refuge in you. Let integrity and straightness guard me for I have waited for you. Again, those things, if we embrace them, they bring good to us. They will guard us. They will keep us on the path. They will keep us safe. Redeem Yisrael, O Elohim, out of all of his distresses. Proverbs 1, 28 to 33 says, Let them call on me, but I answer not. Let them seek me, but not find me. Because they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of Yehovah. Okay, that's the noun, the fear of Yehovah. So that's the Yira. To fear is a verb. That's Yare. Here we've got the noun form of the verb, which is Yira, the fear of Yehovah. Because they did not accept my counsel, they, dis they despised all of my Reproof again, they didn't fear me, they lightly esteem me rather than that. And when we come to the third part, I'm going to look at what it is to call upon Yehovah uh, to seek Him and to seek His counsel and how it is that we should do that. Therefore, let them eat the fruit of their own way and be filled with their own counsels. For the turning away of the simple slays them in the complacency of fools destroys them. Yahuwah will give them over to the stubbornness of their own heart. They call on him, but he doesn't answer because when he uh, tried to counsel them, they didn't listen. Don't let that be you. But whoever listens to me dwells safely and is at ease from the dread of evil. Proverbs 2, my son, if you accept my words, and treasure up my commands with you, so that you make your ear attend to wisdom, incline your heart to understanding. For if you cry for discernment, uh, lift up your voice for understanding. If you seek her as silver and search for her as hidden treasures, then you, so, you would understand the fear of Yehovah and find knowledge of Elohim. If you are looking for his words and you actually are one who cherishes them, then you would understand the fear of Yehovah. The way of the wrong is like darkness. They don't know at what they stumble. It has not been given to them to understand the secrets of the kingdom of heaven. So if it has been given to you, don't then turn your back on it. Don't then be disobedient because Yeshua says to those people, all that they have, that understanding of the secrets of the kingdom of heaven, even that shall be taken from them. You can understand the secrets of the kingdom of heaven perfectly well, but if you use that understanding and then you turn your back on him, then even that will be taken from you. For Yehovah gives wisdom. Out of his mouth come knowledge and understanding, and he treasures up stability for the straight, a shield to to those walking blamelessly to watch over the paths of judgment and the way of his kind ones he guards then you would understand righteousness and judgment and straightness every good path for wisdom would enter your heart and knowledge would be pleasant to your soul the way of the wrong though they don't like that knowledge isn't pleasant to them because what they know they don't want to do and so what is meant for good actually entails evil on them because they make their hearts a stone. They know the law, they have the letters of the law written on their heart, but it entails unto them death. Discretion would guard you, understanding would watch over you to deliver you from, from the evil way, from the man who speaks perversities. 
those who leave the path, paths of straightness to walk in the ways of darkness, who rejoice to do evil, they delight in the perversities of evil. So knowledge isn't pleasant to their soul. You, it may well be given to you to understand the secrets of the kingdom of heaven. You may well start to w walk in the paths of straightness, but we have a warning. It's possible to leave the paths of straightness for the deceivableness of sin, instead to be that in which we delight. Whose paths are crooked and they are perverted in their ways to deliver you from the strange woman, from the foreigner who flatters with her words, who forsakes the companion of her youth and has forgotten the covenant of her Elohim. For her house is sunk down to death and her paths to the dead. And that is uh, the end for those who leave the paths of straightness, who had understanding, but then they leave the paths of straightness and even what they had is taken from them. They forget the covenant of the Elohim. They behold their natural faces in a mirror and then they go away and they forget. None going into it does return, nor do they reach the paths of life. So walk in the way of goodness and guard the paths of righteousness. For the straight shall dwell in the earth and the tamim, the complete, the whole, shall be left in it. But the wrong shall be cut off from the earth and the treacherous ones plucked out of it. Ecclesiastes 12 verse 13 is the best summation of all of this thought that there is in all of scripture. And we'll end this part on this verse. Let us hear the conclusion of the entire matter. Yahweh Elohim and cherish his commands. This to all mankind. Okay, so last time I did this Torah portion a couple of years ago, um, I spoke about what I'm going to speak about in this third part. Um, coming off this verse uh, it is Yehovah who is going before you he himself is with you he does not fail you nor forsake you do not fear nor be discouraged and what I was speaking about is the fact that Yehovah is with us um, and he is the one who guides our steps and that when we are um, praying to him we don't need to be asking him what we should do in a certain situation basically he has given us his word he's given us his counsel and that should cover all of the situations in our life if there's a specific situation and a specific choice that needs to be made in that moment then going to Yehovah for what we should do is um is not fruitful if we're waiting on his decision on things that are inherently our decision, then um, it can just lead to uh, frustration and it can also lead people um, astray and lead people into thinking that the decisions of their own mind are what Yehovah has said to do. They'll say things like, uh, this kind of revelation came to me and I just, I have peace with it. And they take things like that as Yehovah directly instructing them as to what to do. The word tells us what right and wrong is. So if we have a decision about which way to turn left or right in a the street, there's no point in praying to Yehovah and asking him, should I turn to the left? Or should I turn to the right? Um, he's told us the guidelines within which we can operate. So we can actually make the decision to turn whichever way we want in the street. As long as we're not breaking his word, then it is good with him, whichever one we choose. But people get very kind of caught up in the idea of asking Yehovah, about decisions in their life. Now, there's an important caveat to that. Yehovah guides our steps. 
and we should ask him for his guidance. But he doesn't need to tell us beforehand how he's going to guide us. We should trust him that he is with us in all situations. So if we walk to the left, we choose to take the left-hand path, Yehovah will be with us in that. And if he doesn't want us to take the left-hand path, we won't take it because he will change events so that we take the right-hand path. He will cause something for us to um, change our decision if he wants to. But for the uh, large part, our decisions are our domain. As long as it's not sin, then it's okay for us to make the decisions in our own life. It's very much like when he brought all the animals to Adam and he asked Adam to name the animals. He didn't have Adam pray to him as to what the names should be. He was happy to look on Adam and what Adam decided to choose the animals, uh, choose as the animals' names rather. And that's true in our life as well. He's happy to look upon us. And as long as we're heeding his counsel and we're walking according to his word, it's okay for us to make those decisions. I said last time that people, you know, going through life sometimes can seem confusing. It can seem overwhelming. And so the tendency, what seems uh, comfortable to our minds is, well, I'm not going to make any decision about which way I should go. I'm going to leave all of that in Yehovah's hands. And what that actually amounts to is testing Yehovah. You don't um, rely upon him to tell you what decision to make. You do rely on him to guide your path and you absolutely should be praying to him for his guidance to guide your steps and for you to make plans but for him to guide your steps that's absolutely good to pray for but it's not good to ask him what his decision is in a decision that we have in our lives nor is that scriptural there's actually also been a great deal of um, secular study done on the topic of revelation, receiving revelation about things. And um, what these secular scientists have found, they will then say, well, this is what Christians are doing when they're praying to God. And they're right, it is what they're doing. And what it amounts to is when you have some quiet time to think about something, like when you're praying and you're asking what decision you should make, revelation can come to you about things in your life. And secular people have exactly the same experience as Christians will have, and Christians will call it revelation from God, when in fact it's not. It's just, uh, it appears to be the way that Yehovah has designed us in order to for solutions to kind of crystallize in our mind the way that he's designed our mind the difference should be with believers Torah keepers Christians whatever you want to call yourselves that you are familiar with the word of Elohim and you act in accordance with it and in fear of him so this revelation that comes to you will be in uh, alignment with the word and that that is, uh, that is good. You train yourself in the word so that when you do make these decisions about which way to go, they are in alignment with the word. And that's what Yehovah expects. But as I say, secular people have these moments of revelation too. What we must not do is have a moment of revelation about something and then call that Yehovah speaking to us because that's not what it is. And to label something as Yehovah speaking to you when it's not is something that he um, finds abhorrent. He speaks very strongly against people who um, come up with things in their own minds, in their own hearts, and then call that the word of 
Yahovah, that they've been instructed by Yahovah. So we shouldn't attribute to him um, things that we have received as revelation, if you like. As, as I say, people all, all over the world receive these sorts of revelation. And if we take that and we say, oh, I just had this idea come to me and now I, I have peace with it. And therefore that is God himself telling me to do that thing. That is very bad. When we have these moments of revelation, when whatever it is crystallizes and we decide the direction, that seems to be the way that he's designed us to be. And all sorts of people have that experience. So I think, I used this picture last time as well, I think that one of the things which causes people to do this, and how it seems to me, is that people are fearful about the future, they're fearful about making decisions. So what they want to do is to put it all on God and say, well, I prayed about it and I got an answer, so that's what I did. So if any... Um, bad things happen in the future it's kind of it's all put on god and it must have been what god wanted me to do for some greater purpose or something like that rather than just saying well i make the decisions in my own life i ask him to guide my steps in everything so that if i'm going to do something foolish he guides my steps away from that that's what we we should be doing but there's a huge difference in him commanding us to do something and us kind of deciding to do something deciding that that's good and that we've got peace with doing that and then calling that um revelation from god in ecclesiastes 11 4 to 6 it says he who watches the wind does not sow he who looks at the clouds does not reap as you do not know what is the way of the wind or how the bones grow in the womb of her who is with child, so you do not know the works of Elohim who makes all. So if you're always looking and you're always watching the wind and you won't sow, if you're always looking at the clouds trying to determine what is the future here, then you will never reap. You don't know what Elohim will do. You don't know how he's going to guide your path all of that is Elohim's realm what he should be doing what he has control over but what people kind of want to do is to have like a voyeuristic insight into Elohim's realm leave those things which Elohim is in charge of in his control because the likelihood is you're not going to be able to understand it all or put it all together even if he told you a bit of what the future is or a bit of what he was going to do it's much better for us to do what we know is in accordance with what is right to make plans ourselves that are in accordance with his word and then leave to him the guidance of our steps leading us here or leading us there leading us to something or away from something verse 6 says sow your seed in the morning and until evening do not let your hand rest since you do not know which prosper this or that or whether both alike are good you don't know what the outcome is going to be just do according to what his word says to do make decisions for yourself about what you're going to do ask him to guide you away from bad things towards good things and to be intimately involved in your life like you would want of a real life father or a, a physical world father of course he is a real life father ecclesiastes 11 9 says rejoice O young man in your youth and let your heart gladden you in the days of your youth and walk in the ways of your heart and in the sight of your eyes but know that for all these elohim brings you into judgment and that is the key. Walk in the ways of your heart and in the sight of your eyes. Make your own decisions. Live your own life. But know that for everything you do, Elohim will bring you into judgment. So make sure that it is in accordance with his word. And as you're going about it, ask him to guide your steps and to be with you. Proverbs 16 verse 9 says, A man's heart plans his way, but Yehovah establishes his steps 
So I'm invite that, invite that guidance. So this is the way that is. You can plan things in your heart. And if you want Yehovah to be um, involved and ask him for guidance, then he can change the course of your path. We've looked at Jeremiah before, who was told to go um, and speak to the king of Judah. And he went to do that according to how he thought it should be done. And as he was leaving the city, he got arrested, which would have seemed like a terrible thing to him. But by being arrested, he was put in a place where he could speak to the king of Judah. So Yehovah was guiding his steps. He was, um, he was planning his way, but Yehovah was establishing his steps. And that's what we should desire rather than saying, Father, tell me what I should do next. He's already told us what is good. Proverbs 19 verse 21 says, many are the plans in a man's heart, but it is the counsel of Yehovah that stands. Don't think, oh, maybe I'll make the wrong decision. Maybe I'll do something which is against Elohim's will, against his plan, because his counsel will stand. Whatever you decide, whatever you plan in your heart to do, if he wants you to do something else, that's exactly what you will end up doing. And he's with us. He cares for us. He's with us. He guides our steps as we make our plans. So you gain a good understanding from his word of what is good. And then as you plan your way through life in accordance with what is good, then he is in the background guiding your steps or actually probably more accurately he's in the foreground guiding your steps he is the one who will make your plans come to fruition or he'll guide you somewhere else it's why we're told to not say you know next week i'm going to such and such a city but we should say you are willing or god willing um i will go to such and such a city because we make the plans but if they're not in accordance with his will they will not come about ezekiel 13 2 to 3 is a stark warning against having these moments of revelation deciding something in our hearts and then saying it came from yahovah so son of man prophesy against the prophets of israel who prophesy and say to those who prophesy out of their own heart, hear the word of Yehovah. Thus said the master Yehovah, woe to the foolish prophets who are following their own spirit without having had a vision. And that's how people are when they have revelation which comes from themselves. And because it came to them in a moment and they don't understand the mechanism by which it came to them, they attribute that to Yehovah doing it but Yehovah warns us very very strongly against doing that he abhors it when people represent things from their own hearts and from their own minds as being from him so we should absolutely seek to distance ourselves from any kind of thinking like that and if you've done it ignorantly in the past then repent acknowledge that it is not good and repent and turn away from it and of course Yehovah all he wants for his children is to lead them to what is good and you know maybe in the past he has allowed in your ignorance he has reached you in that moment in that way because he is able to reach you in that way but we shouldn't seek to try and have Yehovah communicate with us in a way which is um, not scriptural. We should always seek him as he is because that is the best that we could expect. Proverbs 21 verse 30 says, there is no wisdom or understanding or counsel against Yehovah. You can use all the plans of your own heart. You can come up with all the plans of your own heart but there is nothing that will stand against Yehovah. So don't worry that you're going to make the wrong decision and it's going to be against what he actually wants. 
Isaiah 45, 9 to 13 says, Woe to him who strives with his maker, a potsherd with the potsherds of, of earth. Does clay say to him who forms it, What are you making? Or your handiwork? Say he has no hands. Woe to him who says to his father, What are you bringing forth? Or to the woman, What are you laboring over? Thus said Yehovah, the set apart one of Yisrael and his maker, Do you ask me about my sons, what is to come? And about the work of my hands, do you command me? And it's kind of another thing that people do. They have these moments of revelation, let's call it. And then they decide what Yehovah is telling them he's going to do in the future. And then they move towards that, um, that outcome as if, Yehovah told them that he was going to do something in the future and then they try to uh, having gleaned this voyeuristic knowledge of the future they try to then create that future in their own lives I have made the earth and created man on it uh, I my hands have stretched out the heavens and all their host I have commanded I have stirred him up in righteousness and all his ways I make straight he builds my city and lets my exiles go, not for price nor reward, declares Yehovah Sabaoth. And he's talking about Cyrus here. He was able to guide Cyrus's steps to do what he desired for Cyrus to do. So we shouldn't inquire about the future. What, what are you bringing forth, Yehovah? We should leave those things in his hands. He's more than capable. Think of all the things that he's done he made the earth and created man on it and he brought about all the events of history why would we think to stop him and say i need to know uh, what the future is before i can continue in my journey i'm just waiting on you to do whatever it is or i've decided that you're bringing this thing forth and so i'm going to help you do it he doesn't need our help leave what's in his hands to him and take what's in our hands, in our, our hands, make decisions for ourselves and live our own lives knowing that he is ultimately in control. Job 8, 10 to 15 says, do they not teach you, speak to you and bring forth words from their heart? Does papyrus grow without a marsh, a reed thrive without water? While it is yet green, not cut down, it dries out before any plant. So are the paths of all who forget ale and the expectancy of a defiled one does perish. Okay, these are the ones who do not fear Yahuwah, but it's not that way for us. Whose refuge is cut off and whose trust is a spider's web. Okay, so they trust in all the wrong things. They trust on what they can gather to themselves. They, um, they are trying to govern the course of their life, not in accordance with what Yehovah has said. We govern the course of our own lives in accordance with what he said. He leans on his house, but it does not stand. He holds it fast, but it does not last. Okay, so they trust in things that are uh, inherently not to be trusted. We trust in Yehovah. My point here being, don't confuse uh, trusting in Yehovah with asking him about every decision and asking him ahead of you making the decision uh, to tell you what to do and then feel like you've come to some uh, great understanding that comes from Elohim. It's all about trusting in him. It's trusting that he is with you. Trust in the thing, the refuge upon which you can lean. And he will guide your steps and he will bring you to the right place. Now, I know this part is very short um, and I'm going to end on this point. I'm going to speak a little bit about this because as I was reading this scripture, this part of it stuck out to me. Do they not teach you, speak to you and bring forth words from their heart? Now, We've been looking at this from a certain perspective, but I've been meaning to speak for a while about um, the name Yahuwah. And I've had 
you know, multiple people try to rebuke me for not using the sacred name of Yahuwah and you can only be saved by one name and that name is Yahuwah according to them. Um, but ironically, these are people who are listening to people who have brought forth a word from their own heart because the word Yahuwah is not a Hebrew word. It's impossible in Hebrew um, to have the word Yahuwah as far as we know. The way Hebrew is written, you have a consonant, then you have a vowel sound, and then a consonant, and a vowel sound, and then a consonant. And if a word is to end with a vowel sound, then uh, the consonant at the end will be a hey, or an ayin, or an aleph, and those consonants take um, the sound of the vowel before them. So to have the word ya, hu, a is impossible because u is a vowel sound and a is a vowel sound also. And you cannot in Hebrew have two vowels following on one from another. A question that I was asked was, well, what about the word Yahuda? Okay, it sounds like the word Yahuda, doesn't it? But Yahuda is different in an important way. It has a dalit, a d, between the u and the a. So it's Yahu consonant dalit a. That's why we can have the word Yahuda. Um, people get confused and mentioned this before, but that Yahoo is in the name of many people. So their logic dictates that that must be the name of Elohim. But we see the same people who are named with Yahoo named elsewhere with just Yah. Yah is his poetic name. Like Yeshurun is the poetic name for Yisrael. Yah is the poetic name for uh, yod -Heh -Vav -Heh. Um, you also get prophets with the name Ale or the, the word Ale in their names, like Dani Ale. It's just God. So if it has Yah in it or Ale, then it is a reference to Yah or to Elohim, to Ale. But that doesn't mean that's how uh, yod -Heh -Vav -Heh must be pronounced. Now, I can't tell you absolutely how Yote Vav He must be pronounced. What I can tell you is that we have um, many, many record of it being written down with certain vowel pointings. Okay, the letters Yod He Vav He are just four consonants. Okay, when Josephus writes and says that his name is four vowels, he's writing in Greek. Um, and in Greek, yod -Hey, vav -Hey, is four vowels. Um, so if you've got four consonants and you haven't got the vowels written down, then you don't know how to pronounce those four consonants. The thing is, we do have the vowels written down many, many times. Even in scripture where you don't have um, the vowel pointings put in place for yod -Hey, vav -Hey, when you have yod -Hey vav -Hey as part of the name of a city or a town, then the vowel pointings are there. Uh, and they are a shiva vowel. We think of that maybe as like an apostrophe that follows the yod. And then we have a cholam vowel, which makes an o sound. And that follows the he. Um, and then we have a, a, a patak or a kemet, kemet vowel um, between the vav and the he, so, which makes va. Okay, so we've got that recorded many, many times. I can't tell you that that's definitely what it is, but I can tell you that all the evidence points to that being what it is. So the pronunciation that that would make is y. Y apostrophe y ho va, and that is actually also uh, a contract. Okay, um, <laughs> well, we had 
yesterday when I was recording the bit of the video that you were just watching, we had the power cut soon after uh, where the video is cut. Um, it's a fantastic example of what I was talking about earlier in this part about how uh, Yehovah can, can guide your steps because just before we had a power cut, I had just saved settings on the recording software that we use uh, to record so that um, if there is a power cut, the file type is robust and it will cut the recording where, um, where the last point was. So you'll get all of the recording up to the power cut. And I'd done that just before recording uh, the third part. So it's a great example um, of that in action. Yalva works in the background and you can bring up all of those things about. But I was talking about um, the name Yehovah. Uh, Yehovah, what I was uh, to say next was that Yehovah is a contraction of the three uh, forms or three forms of the verb, the Hebrew verb, to be, the verb to be, as in to be um, in existence, I suppose. That is actually a verb. It's something that you do and you can have it in the past tense, the present tense, the future tense, the perfect tense and the future tense, the present tense. Um, and that's how he explains what his name is. He says to Moses in the bush, he says, tell them that I am has sent you and then they'll know that Yehovah has sent you which is a puzzling statement unless you know that Yehovah is all the forms of to be. He who was, he who is, I am. He who is to come. So that's the only way that I can make out that that statement makes any sense at all. Um, and Yehovah, his name actually meaning he who was, is, and is to come. Uh, fits in with other scriptures that we have scripture in in Revelation and I'm not going to go through all of that again I've been through it before and I can't tell you that his name is definitely Yehovah um, all I can do is in my own life when I'm choosing how to pronounce yod -Heh vav -Heh, I can say what is the most likely it could be that the way that we pronounce all the vowels is not the way that they pronounce the vowels. It's very unlikely because of things like poetry that we have and we've got some kind of idea of the pronunciation of vowels, but it could well be that that is the case. Um, but if the pronunciations that we have of the vowels are right, then Yehovah is the most likely. It's the one that we have recorded many 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 times and you you know you can come up with your own justifications of the jews who are trying to hide the true name or whatever but they're just stories if you want to believe that story that's okay for me and i know for charlie when we're considering uh how we're going to pronounce the name um we're certainly not going to go with yahuwah which is a word that as far as we know is impossible in Hebrew. We have no reason to think that it is a possible word and every reason to think that it's an impossible word. Um, the reasons that people give for going with Yahuwah just don't stand up to scrutiny. So for us, when we're making that decision, we, um, we go with what is the most likely. Again, I can't tell you how to pronounce yod -Heh vav -Heh. But I can tell you that the one that we have the most evidence for by far is Yehovah. I know that people have uh, contentions about whether it's a Vav or a War or however you pronounce that. But having looked into it extensively and looked at the argument on both sides of that, it certainly does seem that it's pronounced Vav 
with a V. We have uh, poetry where the Vav is rhymed, uh, is rhymed with uh, the Beit when it doesn't have a Dagesh, which makes a V sound. So the only way that those two things could rhyme is if the Vav was pronounced Vav. If you've only heard one person or multiple people making the argument on one side, I would suggest that you're probably not um, in a good position to make a determination. You've, you've heard what seemed to be a convincing argument, on, but only on one side of the matter. Look into both sides of the matter and see if you can educate yourself about what people on the other side of any argument, but particularly that argument, say. Um, ultimately, the name by which you are saved isn't how you pronounce his name, though. It's his character. It's who he, that's who he is. That's what calling on his name is. It's not, you know, shouting out Yahuwah or Yahovah or whatever other pronunciations that people want to have. Um, so ultimately, what is important is that we're calling upon that name and that we understand that's what it's talking about and that pronunciation isn't going to progress us any further in his kingdom if we don't understand what his name is, his word, his character, and we seek to emulate who he is and we call upon that. Um, if, we, if we haven't got that, then we're lost. Um, but for anybody that would seek to try to rebuke us for using the name Yehovah, I would suggest that maybe your understanding of the issue is not as complete as you would like to imagine. Uh, we've looked at it extensively. We've looked at the arguments on all sides and Yehovah is the best evidenced pronunciation that we have. And that's why we're, we're going to go with it. That's why, um, that's why you'll hear it in our videos. If that's not what you've been taught, then, you know, just imagine that we are probably aware of whatever it is that you've heard. We have probably considered it um, in our own considerations. And maybe consider that, you know, you have to give room to the fact that you might be incorrect over that. Talking about Yahovah, giving you guidance and praying to Yahovah. Um, after we had the power cut, and now we're speaking to Ashley about it, she said that, you know, it's not a bad thing for people to ask Yahovah if they're making a decision about something, um, if he speaks to them directly. And I don't think that's many people's experience of prayer, them speaking to Yehovah and waiting for words from him to be spoken to them. I know that that's something that uh, she has experienced in time past, not every time she prays, of course, but it is certainly possible for Yehovah to tell you something. But my point is don't confuse an idea of revelation and, oh, I, I suddenly had an idea about what I was to do. That must be Yehovah telling me what to do. If he speaks to you words, then of course he's able to do that. And of course that's scriptural. We see that all the way throughout scripture, him talking to people in words. But don't confuse your own thinking on the subject as being from Yehovah simply because it all seemed to crystallize in a moment and you had a, a feeling of peace about it. That's, uh, that's what I'm trying to say with it. Shall we pray? Father, I thank you that we are your children and that you look after us and that you never fail us or forsake us and you're there when we want to speak with you. Um, 
Thank you that you, you're kind to us. Thank you for directing things in our lives that we're unaware of, for guiding our steps. Thank you for being with us throughout difficulties and throughout trials. Thank you that we can depend upon you. Thank you for your name. Thank you that you are somebody who is merciful and compassionate and who saves people from their enemies. Thank you, Father. Amen.